Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you'd like to get two additional bonus live streams twice a month, be able to read my comic books on an online digital archive, be able to access a exclusive Discord server with fellow creators where we share artwork, feedback, work in progress, give each other creative critiques, um, share tips and tricks and such, you can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. There are higher tiers for additional rewards, but as little as $2 a month gets you in. Please feel free to, uh, to subscribe. There's a link in the description for the video. Check that out. If you'd like to get a free digital sketchbook, work in progress, animated gifts delivered right to your inbox, blog posts about what I'm reading, watching, writing. I'm, well, yeah, I'll about what I'm writing. Um, <laughs> you can get all of that by signing up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. That's Jeremy spelled G-E-R-I-M-I. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally on Kindle Comixology, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. that will forward you to my Amazon author page. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up my most recent project, Morning Star. It's a two-volume series. It tells the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven as a western. Volume 1 contains issues 1 through 4. Volume 2 contains a conclusion, issues 5 through 8. Both volumes have extensive back matter, character sketches, thumbnails, page layouts, script excerpts, photo reference, and more. I basically show you how I put all the put the book together. You can check out all of that at Amazon.jeremy.net. And on the homepage of my YouTube channel, you can also see book flip-throughs of all the each of those books. You can see what's inside. All right. So let us get started. See, Byron's in the chat. He says, finally catch the stream this week. Good to have you on here, man. Thanks for, uh, for, for catching me. All right. Um, so we're actually going to pick up right where we left off last, last week. Uh, I've been doing studies of John Byrne from, uh, from Days of Futures Past. And the intent of these studies is not to do a master study where I'm trying to draw exactly what John Byrne draws to capture his beautiful rendering and style and storytelling. The goal here is actually to study his storytelling, the composition, how the characters move through the panel and how each panel relates to each other. Um, the backstory of this is that I was talking with a fellow artist who I think is an excellent draftsman and he was concerned about doing interior comic book pages because his pinups I think look great. He said he just wasn't sure how to actually, he felt like he didn't know how to draw interiors. And, you know, I told him, for me, that the best way, the way you learn is by studying the masters. The same way you learn values or working from colors or studying anatomy is by studying master, you know, master artists. And John Byrne is one of the storytelling greats when it comes to comics. So I thought, let me take a look at his. I see Martin's in the chat. Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks for, uh, thanks for rolling in. Good to see you. Good to have you back. Let's see here. Mars is in the chat. Good to see you, Mars. Said that I just completed my physical therapy for my hand and can officially grip a pencil with little to no pain. That is some great news. Happy to hear that. Let's see here. Yeah, that has got to be one of the most frustrating things in the world to be an artist and to not be able to actually do any uh, any artwork. You know limited by your hands. Um, but it's an argument for, uh, for mid-journey. Anyway, so where we're going, I, uh, I already did a quick breakdown of the previous page, and it's uh, the X-Men battling the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And this page now is that the battle storm has you know, released a, a blast of wind and, and rain and, and clouds blowing all of the participants of the battle out into the street. So... We're picking up here. There's a there's an upshot showing the characters, you know, comp composed together within this blast cloud. All of a bunch of figures on the street just passes by, looking up at what's you know what's going on. Now, like I said, with all these, the point of this is not to do a beautiful rendering. It is to just study the the gesture and the composition of the pages. So for all the figures, I'm drawing them with just simple 
boxes and stick figures because this was one of the things that I wanted to express to the other artists I was talking to is that in terms of studying these things, in terms of studying storytelling, you don't need to be a great drafts person. You don't need to be able to draw really well. In order to study storytelling, you need to understand gesture and perspective. Perspective is challenging, but gesture, you can just do it all with boxes and stick figures. So that boxes and stick figures and cylinders. So that's what I've been doing here. So I'm starting here with, uh, and I always try to look at what are the compositional elements in each panel. And for this, you've got two figures in the foreground running away from the fight. And they're sort of narrating what's going on. You know, they're saying that they're reporters and they've got to get this story into the paper. Well, they don't actually say that they're reporters, but I think that that's implied. And then in the background is the actual action of Angel and Nightcrawler fighting uh, Avalanche and Pyro from the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, along with down in here, little guy running away in the background. So, let's see here. Ha, I see Travis in the chat. Hey, how you doing, Travis? Thanks for rolling in. Good to see you, man. That thumbnail looks kind of ill. <laughs> anyway, um, like I said, I'm doing breakdowns, storytelling breakdowns of uh, storytelling studies of John Byrne from uh, from Days of Futures Past. So I'm going to start here with just the, uh, the ground plane and blocking in these two figures in the front that are sort of running away from the chaos. So that first line I put in there is just to kind of give me the overall height of the figure, blocking in where his feet are, where his head is, and then the same with the uh, the second figure, just kind of approximating where her head ends in relationship to his. And you don't even see her feet touch the ground plane. So I'm just kind of looking at where her her feet end, which is you know kind of down here at the, this point, down here at the page. So from there, I start with just a simple boxing into the figure. So I figure out with the uh, the first figure where his hips are. Because you can divide the human body into half. Legs below, torso, and head above. So you kind of divide the figure in half. And now there's some perspective coming here because you've got the pelvis of the figure. Let's see. But really, you've kind of got his pelvis going... His pelvis, I guess, would be tilted forward because his body's coming towards us, you know, because his leg, that front leg is coming towards us. And then you've got the upper body. So he's bent forward and he's running. Then you've got the upper body tilted and twisted. You know what? I realized I started taking a little bit of a cheat there. That... I need to fix that. The, the cheat here is that dynamically, I get a nice feeling, a nice feeling when I got the uh, the first box coming towards us this way, and then you've got the lower box bent and coming that way. But the fact of the matter is that when we run, we tend to run with our body completely tilted this way. It just looks weird because of that other leg coming forward, but the fact of the matter is that, let me erase this, really his whole body both lower and upper torso should be coming forward and it's really more that there's a twist here so both these boxes are coming towards us but one is tilted so we're seeing this side the other is tilted so we're seeing that side. That's actually what's happening here. And it took me a second to kind of look at this and analyze that and say, wait, what am I doing wrong? But you know what? That's the point of doing these studies. It's not that you look at it and you're just copying blindly. You look at things and you try to understand what's happening. And sometimes I'll look at it and my first impression, what I think is happening with the figure, I'm like, oh, wait, that is not what's happening here. Let 
He's kind of looking over his shoulder. At the figures behind him. Let's see here. Amara says, uh, making a sketchbook cover because I uh, made a text block yesterday. Cool. And Travis says, uh, John Byrne is a great storyteller. You know, I, I will tell you, um, I was watching the, uh, the, the first episode of the new She-Hulk um, Marvel Disney Plus series, and it made me nostalgic because I've actually never read John Byrne's uh, She-Hulk run. And I found it at my local library, so picked it up. Was uh, was reading that, and I was reading these cartoons that John, these comics that John Byrne drew back in like the early '80s. Like he was drawing them before I was even reading comics. He was drawing, it was like '87, '88, '89, and I'm reading these. And I'm like, wow, I feel like the storytelling in the She-Hulk comics were even better than his, you know, highly lauded uh, X-Men run. Like, it just, it's stunning how amazing of a storyteller he is. And they're funny. They are really funny. Like, they are just as funny as the, um, oops, I do not want to smudge that. They're just as funny as the, uh, the TV show is. Anyway, I'm starting to get a little bit too caught up in anatomical details, which is not the point here. So I kind of need to rein this in. I'm doing a little bit too much drawing and not enough just structural stick figure which is what I, the intent was. But anyway, the main thing of this panel is that it's composed of a guy running towards a guy, a man and a woman running to, running towards the camera away from a, a melee. And again, as usual, you know, he keeps the action moving from left to right. But yeah, all this stuff, the head, the arms, the torso, it's all just cubes, cubes and cylinders. And you can use a circle. You can do all this stuff with circles as well. The cubes and cylinders just make it easy for me to get keep this sense of uh, perspective. But all this stuff can be done with egg shapes and cylinders just as well as it can be done with cubes. And some would argue it's better to do it with rounder forms because I definitely have a bad habit of making my, my artwork a little too blocky. So you've got these two figures in the foreground running away from the chaos. And I am going to throw a little stick figure in the back down here of this guy running away. You know, and it's interesting. I, I pointed out that the ground plane was the uh, the horizon line in one of the panels on the uh, the previous page that I did last week. And I think that that's a, a trick. I noticed like all of these panels, the horizon line is super low. I think that that's a trick that Byrne uses when he's drawing um, action scenes to really make everything that's happening feel over the top and dramatic. So now down here, this other fight that's going on, you can kind of use this first figure that's blocked in, or these first two figures that are blocked in, you can use them as kind of a measurement device for how to block in the rest of the uh, the page. Well, the rest of the panel, the, the two figures are in the background. Because you can look at like Angel, he's below, all of the, what's going on here is below this guy's hips. 
So you can kind of look at about where his knee is and say, all right, Angel's head is about, well, it's below his knee, really. If you're going to go directly across. You've got him here. Laying one on uh, Pyro. Just funny, you would think that a guy whose only power really is flying would not be able to kick the ass of a guy who is a pyrokinetic. The power would just be like, we're about to have some roast chicken. Just light him up. You know, one of my early favorite comics when I first really started getting into it was uh, Walt Simonson and Louise Simonson's run on, uh, on X Factor. And I remember when they had the, uh, the Fall of the Mutant storyline and they had Angel getting his wings cut off and then coming back as Archangel. Part of the whole point of those characters was they wanted to really up their, uh, their power levels for like the modern comic book story landscape where there were so many other mutants with incredible powers. They were like, let's just make them all more powerful. And they turned Archangel into like, you know, it's just a dude who flies. And they're like, he should have gotten, gotten his, his ass kicked a long time ago. And they turned him into this flying razor winged death machine. Which I loved. I mean, to me, he was sort of like, he became kind of like the flying Wolverine. Couldn't control his wings, always wanted to fight, super moody. Really felt like me as a teenager. I mean, not that I got into fights, but I think all teenagers are kind of moody by default. And I will tell you that looking at this, Compositionally, it's not a big deal, but I've noticed that my capacity for keeping things, for my, my visual measurements for proportion, I don't know if it's because I haven't been doing in-person classes in a long time, but it definitely feels like they have fallen off because I noticed that the feet, I drew them here and they're about the, it seems like they're about the right position, but they should really be, I don't know. Far, this guy's foot should be a little bit farther to the left because I'm looking at where it lands in terms of the proportion of the screen versus where I have it here. Mine, his foot is like almost in the middle of the screen. And really it should be, you know, about that far over. Not important to the overall storytelling, just something I'm noticing about my own drawing. Hey, Amar is in the chat. Just saw you sneak in there. Good to see you, man. Let's see here. All right. And that, what made me realize that my proportions were so far off is the fact that I went to put Nightcrawler and Avalanche fighting in here. And yes, Avalanche is partly off of the screen, but I've really got these two crammed into this corner and they should have a little bit more room than that. That's what made me realize, oh, I am drawing this with not enough space. And it just amazes me how well Burn can completely like, you know, Nightcrawler's tail. You can tell with such a tiny, tiny drawing you can still completely tell that that's Nightcrawler, you know? And you can chalk that up to also um, Dave Cockrum's great character designs, but it's just, you know, still, it, it, I find it very masterful to be able to have tiny little background figures and yet you can still see all of the detail. So now we've got a shot of like, oh yeah, I think I'd mentioned this last week. Everyone else got blown out of there, but Blob obviously didn't get blown out. In this mass of characters up here, Blob didn't get blown out of the, uh, the building because, you know, he's the immovable object. So 
So now let's get the facade of this Capitol building here. That's actually where this fight's supposed to be taking place, is in Washington, D.C. So I'm just real lightly sketching in here. And what's interesting is I'm always looking to avoid tangents, trying to fight tangents. Um, and I noticed as I was blocking the perspective here, I was like, well, in order to figure frame this out, I kind of need to uh, get this bottom line of the building there. And I realized as it comes over here, it almost forms a tangent with the next panel, which normally that is, you know, it's very bad. You don't want to have it where a large visual element lines up with the visual element on a different page. But two things. One, the coloring is so different on this panel, the panel on the right in the, the bright yellow to the, the line being black. And the second thing is that the subtle difference in direction, it's going this way and then subtly it turns down. And those two things enough, the, the fact of it being completely black versus fully rendered, and then that change of direction, I think is enough to keep it from feeling like a tangent. But in this simple, loose sketch figure -y drawing I'm doing, I'm gonna have to adjust that position because I think it will feel like a tangent. So I'm just sort of putting in simple bots. You're kind of dividing the, the building up, figuring out where like the major lines are. Because all this really needs is just a little bit of simple perspective to give that sense of the building. I don't need to go in here and draw an elaborate. Now, I will tell you that having looked at John Byrne's um, Never Win comic, where he's sort of like continuing what would happen if he continued doing the X-Men after he left, after uh, the Dark Phoenix saga. And uh, you don't see it, but he draws like... There's a perspective grid. Anything that's wider than a headshot that has some sort of environment behind it, John Byrne has like a perspective grid on the whole thing. And it is amazing. Um, I wish I could watch a demo of him just drawing his perspective grids before he lays in the page because it's not like he's using a stock template perspective grid, or at least it doesn't look like it. It looks like he's drawing a fresh perspective for each page and he grids it out and then lines up all the figures and all the environments with all feels rich and full in a lived in environment. And then when you look at the actual page, it just seems like this beautifully rendered complex environment. You can see that he did the work to work out the perspective. That's one of the reasons why I say that along with the stick figures, perspective is pretty important to, uh, to, laying out stories well if you've got environments if you just got like blank panels and talking heads it may not be that important Let's see here amaris mentions a uh, love nightcrawler yes nightcrawler is one of uh one of my all-time favorites i mean the fact of the matter is that as awesome as the original five were i think for most people their favorite x-men always always tend to be that group of the all new all different x-men when you look at Storm, Colossus, Wolverine, Kitty, um, I mean, hell, Thunderbird would be on that list if he had survived. Um, spoilers. Yeah, that whole crew, they're sort of like, you know, that was the, the generation that gave the X-Men a shot in the arm. So here's Colossus getting his ass handed to him by uh, by the blob. 
and I've just got his his back arcing forward. You know, he's getting punched. It's like the he's kind of like his body is flying out with the base of his uh his rib cage. Basically, his stomach. He must have got punched in the stomach. It's almost like the his lower back is leading this flying forward. I'm sort of poorly explaining that. What I'm trying to explain here is that, and I'll do it in profile, he's getting socked. He's flying this way. So this region of his lower back is really what's leading. That's what's kind of out in front of us the most. But while that can be very quickly sketched out in a diagram for profile, Blocking that out in perspective from a low angle, that can be quite challenging, which is, again, the reason why I harp on, uh, on cubes and cylinders as a simple tool. Because if you can get this, if you can get this simple a box for the, the upper pelvis, for the upper body, the rib cage, and then a box for the pelvis. And you can get those so that they feel like, oh, this is about the same perspective as what's actually in the layout. Once you get that, then it's like the legs, you can just say, all right, stick figure out here to the knee. And then stick figure out foot fill those in with a little bit of a uh, volume and again I'm not even squaring or cylindering these they're just they really are I'm drawing them like flat shapes which is normally something I say don't do flat. actually you know what here let me you have to make a minor correction there this leg is actually pulled in a little bit more than I have it A little bit like that. I had drawn it with that leg a little bit more extended. And it actually is somewhat extended, but it's also... Oh, that's what it is. I need to put it lower. Lower. Turned out this way. Let's see here. James is in the chat. Good to see you, James. Um, says, I always start with construction lines when drawing the faces. He says, oops, there we go. He says, sometimes I'll have a face with multiple eyes or unusual features. <laughs> Reminds me of a grasshopper. Yeah, you know, um, for me, I, I do use construction lines when I was drawing the head. But I go back and forth between the, the way that I was taught um, – by Carl Ganas in terms of drawing the head is it's similar to um, to the Loomis head, but he kind of has his own different flair on it. But it, the basic part is starting with an egg shape, whereas Loomis kind of starts with just this, let me move down here, whereas Loomis starts with just the sphere and then kind of draws everything off of it. But sometimes I will start drawing the head like, for instance, there's this shot over here of Colossus looking over his shoulder. And it's actually a straight-on shot, but it looks really dynamic because his body is turned away. You know what? Wolverine would be better because there's a little bit of three-quarters upshot. A lot of times I will start by drawing a head. So he said, if Wolverine, that Wolverine that's in the upper corner there, is a three-quarters upshot, I will start by drawing a box and this isn't always sometimes i'll do the the egg shape sometimes i'll do the box but i will start by drawing a box that's taller than it is uh wider and i will start with that uh that angle that the head is like i'm just trying to say all right 
if this is a bounding box for the head, what's that proportion? And then I will go in and I will start to divide the same way that you, you may, I use construction lines the same way you do. But what I'll do is I'll start dividing that box up. So, you know, if I know that the brow is three quarters, or is, is a one third down, the base of the nose is another third down, and the bottom of the chin is another third down. I'll come in and divide it that way. I'll come across on the side and say, all right, here's basically where the ears will be. Then from the ears, I can drop down and angle towards the chin and cut off that little bottom part of the, the base of the skull so I can, and usually I should draw this lighter. I should have sketched this in pretty light because I will usually just draw over that and just throw that base of the neck in there. Point being is that once I get this box in, then I come in in the same way that you do construction lines, I'll come in and I'll just divide you know, the eye socket and the cheekbones, putting in the, uh, the muzzle for the mouth, super tiny. Now that I zoom in, I see how horribly wonky that is. That's what happens when I draw heads too damn small. But, uh, but yeah, I, I definitely use construction lines as well. And then what I'll do is I'll come in and just round the skull off. So imagine if that whole box that I drew in, imagine if I'd actually drawn it in very lightly instead of coming in here like a bull in a china shop. Imagine if I had drawn all of these construction lines as lightly as I should draw them. That makes it very easy to come in and just create the roundness that the figure should have. The angles where it should be on the cheekbone. That side of the, uh, the zygomatic arch wrapping around the, uh, the head wrapping around the uh kind of like the, the face mask of the skull lower part of the cheekbones and then in the case of wolverine slap a mask on that i haven't drawn wolverine in ages But yeah, that's that's basically, you know, I, I definitely use a lot of construction lines. And you can do the same thing with that, with either doing a full egg shape and breaking down the figure, which drawing perfect spheres digitally, I mean, yes, I can hold the screen for a second and have Procreate straighten it for me. When I just draw it freehand and draw the spheres, it's still very wonky. But yeah, you could do the same thing with an egg shape. Break the whole figure down that way. All right, enough of that. Let me continue with these... Uh, Ah, Cyclops, or not Cyclops, Colossus. Oh well, yeah, James says um, uh, marking out features is a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where a lot of times, the way I look at it is that most of the time, I presume that the artists that I see who don't mark things out, they've done it enough that they have this ingrained in their head and they don't have to. They're, they're doing this, but they're doing it mentally. They're not drawing it on paper. 
And I, for as many years as I've been drawing, still need construction lines. Um, I need them to really formulate the figure and, and block things out, get my anatomy and my proportion correct. Um, but I do believe that there is a point in time where if you do this long enough, that all of that, hap you can do all that in your head while you're drawing in real time. And that's where you get the people who just kind of come out and they're just drawing the thing and it looks like it's just magic appearing from their pencil or pen. And I'll also tell you one thing that I'm, I'm noticing here is that I didn't get the tilt correct because the way that Byrne has drawn this, not only does he give you this beautiful angle of the spine arcing, but he actually has the figure tilted. All of this, this angle that's happening is actually tilted this way. So he's kind of tilted to the side in addition to flying towards the camera. And I failed to capture that. And that's one of those things that adds an additional amount of dynamics to the story. And these are the reasons why John Byrne is John Byrne and I'm me. Because <laughs> I look at this and I'm like, oh, yeah, he thought to put some extra subtle tilt in there. But that is also the reason for doing these kinds of studies. You'll do this. You'll draw from someone like Byrne or Walt Simonson or George Perez. And you'll see that they do these extra little flourishes where it's not perfectly squared. The character may be flying towards you, but he tilts in another way, or one way or the other. And you'll say to yourself, huh, I should try doing that in my work. So there is an upside to, uh, well, there's definitely an upside to doing these studies, but there's an upside to noticing that I failed to capture something that Byrne did. Or rather I should say, drawing the study and not noticing these kinds of details, that's a failure. But drawing and then noticing that he, he's doing something a little bit more uh, a little bit more flair, that is something that's the whole point of the learning process is capturing these things that he's doing that we aren't, and then say, ah, okay, I'm gonna try this. Let's see here. Let's see, Johnny's in the chat. How you doing, Johnny? Let's see here. Amaris mentions, she says, uh, who teaches a 10-year-old to use a gun? Some parents aren't very smart to think about what happens when kids have access to guns. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that much. Um, you know, my wife and I don't have kids. I mean, who teaches, who lets, a kid, I mean, you look at butcher knives in the kitchen, kids have access to that. I feel like part of parenting is teaching kids to have respect for dangerous things. Um, I personally wouldn't want my kids to have access to firearms, but I don't, it's first off, it's none of my business when other people, parents do, it's only their business when those kids go out and do something that hurts other people. But in terms of whether a kid should or should not have access to a firearm, I think if the parent is able to convey, which I, that's a big ask, but if you can, you're able to convey to someone that's 10 years old, how dangerous they are. And explain to them that, you know, it's like if there's a family that goes hunting and they take their 10-year-old with them hunting and the kid understands that it's not a toy, that's a very dangerous thing and teaches them respect for it. Um, you know, I think it's up to each. I mean, honestly, I still wouldn't want to do. Here's the thing. I wouldn't really do that unless it was somebody that was older, like a teenager, because we let teenagers drive. I feel like that's kind of the age where you'd want a kid to have that. But that's not for me to say. That's for a parent to say. Um, but then again, you look at how emotionally irrational teenagers can be, and you're like, well, do you really want teenagers having firearms either? I don't know. It's complicated. Let's see here. And James says, uh, I'm more familiar with Burns' Fantastic Four run. You know what's funny? I don't, uh, I actually, I only own one volume of Burns' Fantastic Four run. And I have been meaning to read the entire run. I just, you know, there's so many books out there, so little time. 
Oh, I mentioned at the start of the live stream that I've been reading um, Burns' She-Hulk run because I got really, uh, really inspired after watching the premiere of She-Hulk, and I really enjoyed that. And I've been reading the the She-Hulk comic and John Burns She-Hulk and loving it. It is fantastic. It is spot on. the The tone of the uh, the TV show very funny, very irreverent, and and great storytelling. But yeah, Byrne's fantastic. I mean, Byrne is one of those artists who, if I had these time, he's one of those guys that I'm like, I should read his entire body of work, everything he's ever done. Um, I mean, I'm not a big Star Trek uh, fan, at least not of the comics. I do like the original series and Next Generation. But I know that Byrne has done a lot of Star Wars comics. Those I probably would not, I would probably skip. Um, not out of any distaste, it just... There's so much, so much content and so little time. I really try to split my uh, my reading time into things that I love and things that I am reading for education's with education's sake. Let's see here. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny says, Mr. Jeremy, bring back the goatee. I, I got to tell you, I don't know if um, I'm going to have a goatee again anytime soon. Just because I haven't worn a goatee in, oh, God, it's got to be like at least 10 years now. Probably maybe around the time I first started the YouTube channel, I still had my goatee. Um, I just have really sensitive skin. And that phase between where it's growing from stubble into an actual beard, my face itches so much. And then once you do have the goatee, you have to have um, you have to have like beard conditioner to keep it soft. Otherwise, it just scratches you all the time. Uh, my wife would probably love it. I think she uh, she did think the goatee was uh, kind of sexy, but we've been married long enough that I'm gonna choose comfort over 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 sexy. Um, she stuck with me this long. So I think she's she's willing to put up with me goateeless, but um, but nah, I'm uh, I the goatee. I'm sorry to tell you, as much as I try to to be to be a, a crowd pleaser, I think the goatee is gone for good. And if it does come back, it's gonna be like the McRib. It's gonna be for a limited time only. Um, anyway, really, there's just three figures in in this panel. So there's Colossus. Let me go back to that. Uh... Blue lines there. So there's Colossus getting shot. And this is a lot like storyboarding, to be honest. Colossus getting shot out of the building. Wolverine is it's more like it looked like he was facing someone else and turned in surprise to look at Colossus. And then you've got Storm also coming out from the building, but not coming from uh, some weird exit, not getting blown through the side of the building. But you also notice there's visual storytelling going on here in the sense that, yeah, Wolverine is turning his head, but he's actually looking at the the focus of object the object in this story you kind of their faces are kind of small so you can't really tell what they're looking at but it's implied that they are both looking at the subject the the, the most important thing of this scene and eye lines are very important even if you go back to the the page the panel before um this guy's head isn't turning directly towards the figures but you get the sense from the way his head is turned and his eyes are turned that he's looking at the subject of the uh, the panel. So this is one where you've got people who, they aren't really important to the story, but they're in the foreground looking at the drama that's going on behind. So eye lines are very important, not just uh, perspective and the, the direction the characters are moving, because they're moving away from what they're looking at, but they're, they're looking at a thing that's an object of attention. And that's almost like the little guy that's here that's running in the background carries you compositionally 
In fact, that's really what's happening here. You hear the, the story of what's going on in the word balloon up here. You go to the characters. The characters are looking at the fight that's going on back here. And then you've got the guy running away from the fight. The guy running the fight is the transition. The guy running away in the background is the transition to Colossus. That's composition. That is composition. That is storytelling. You know, and I have to tell you, I didn't realize when I drew this little guy in here in the back that that's what Byrne was doing was a little figure moving you from one panel to the other. But now when I see it, it's so obvious and it's so brilliant. This is why John Byrne is a master storyteller. Um, I need to go back and read some uh, some more Jack Kirby, too, because I know that, you know, everyone loves it. You can't make comics without being influenced by Kirby. But there is no Kirby book that I read a long run of. I have a um, an artist edition, a 90W artist edition of his Mr. Miracle run. I've got a Marvel Essentials of um, his Fantastic Four run that has the, the Galactus story in it. So it's not the first 50 issues. It's the, the second 50 issues. Or I, I guess it's like issue 20-something... 20, 20 Maybe it's issue 25 to 50. That might be it. It's somewhere in there. It's one of the, the higher, it's not the first um, Fantastic Four essential. Um, what other Kirby books do I have? Somewhere I've got a collection of his early uh, Kirby's X Men run. Point is, Kirby, Burn. It, it's like that's what I, I, in terms of the actual storytelling, I mean, I feel like Burn is carrying on the Kirby tradition, as many artists try to do. Let's see here. I'm always scrolling back up a little bit. James mentioned uh, after watching the Punisher, uh, the 2000s Punisher movie, I ended up reading Circle of Blood and really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I will tell you that that's the thing. A lot of these new Marvel movie movies and TV shows are doing is inspiring me to go back and read older works. Like I definitely went back and read um, when Moon Knight came out. I went back and I found uh, my library had a copy of the uh, the Bill Sienkiewicz run. So the, the early Moon Knights. Like I'd already read the, uh, the storyline, the, uh, the Warren Ellis, Declan Shelby, um, one where Mr. Knight, where he's the detective with the tie and the, 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 the tie and the, the vest. I had already read that um, previously. But uh, the Moon Knight show led me to go back and read some older Moon Knight. And there's still some stuff like this, a Jeff Lemire run that I have not uh, not checked out yet. This makes such a nice little perspective plane. It's almost like just this panel up here is just the world coming down at you it's almost like there's a ramp that uh the blob is coming down you know and speaking of a uh, circle of blood mike zek is another one of those artists who i forget how many comics i loved that Mike Zek has drawn. I mean, the Secret Wars, um, you know, his early Punisher stuff, um, Captain America work. I picked up a copy of uh, his per, his art book. And it's not a huge book, but it's just fantastic. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy, it just like, he's one of those, I forget that he's almost like a founding father of the 80s era of Marvel Comics. Let's see here. here we're talking about me and my facial hair johnny's like oh dang i was 18 at the time he said understandable i can't grow facial hair but a mustache you know what i will tell you i miss the days in junior high and high school when i couldn't grow facial hair because honestly now shaving is just a pain in the ass i would be fine if like my face was just baby smooth all the time i have no desire to you know and I don't even shave every single day because that would irritate my face too much. 
it's like my skin is too sensitive to have a beard, but it's also too sensitive to shave every day. So it's like literally I go like two or three days, and then when I start getting scruffy, I shave. So it's like I shave twice a week, sometimes three times a week. But that's like as much as I can put up with. <laughs> now, I love this. For now, we're on the, the facial uh, facial hair convo. <laughs> Byron's like, I have the same issue with my face itching. Not worth the bother a lot of time. And, I, you know, Johnny mentioned he was hungry earlier, and he said, uh, McRib, he said, I'm even more hungry now. Thank God I'm almost off work. Sorry to bring that up, man. I didn't mean to, to, to get your hunger pains going. Wow, Martin, yes. Martin said, uh, Burn is Neil Adams and Kirby combined. Truth, truth. That is, you know, better, better words never said. Hey, you changed your thumbnail. I like that. That's dope. And he's mentioned some of his favorites, Mike Zek and Jim Aparo. You know, uh, Jim Aparo is another one of those guys. Like he's like the the DC Mike Zek. Um, I haven't read a ton of Aparo, but the stuff I remember most were like his Batman work. And then um, I don't know if it gets a lot of much love these days, but the um, his run on the Spirit, not the Spirit, the Spectre. Um, I think before. Uh, Tom Mandrick took over. I think uh, John Ostrander and Jim Aparo, I think, were the ones that that relaunched the the Spectre in the uh, the eighties. <laughs> See, Johnny says uh, you're good. I'm thinking Chipotle. See, now you got me hungry. I haven't had Chipotle in ages. All right, let me get get back in here because we're almost at an, at an hour, and I I started with one panel already drawn. And I still have not finished this page. Um, and this is supposed, the whole point of this is that I intended for it to be a really quick demonstration of just breaking down and analyzing the visual storytelling. So this should not be something that is a long, elaborate process. This should be something where I just come in, lock stuff in, and you're like, oh, okay, I see. In fact, let me cut the opacity down here a little bit. The point is, is something like a building, you can look at it and think of it as this big, complicated thing. But again, a building really is just a grid. It's just another cube with a, with a grid on it. And you can place all of the, uh, the features. And you can also use that grid as a measurement tool. I think a lot of the, the compositional part of, matri of uh, making comics is becoming like Neo from the Matrix. Like you're just, it's looking at the, the zeros and ones beneath the, uh, beneath the, uh, the, the complex drawing that we see and seeing that really it's just, yeah, really simple forms on a grid. So we've got Colossus here. Go back to full opacity. Got his head up there, his body laying on the ground. Can block in his uh, his torso. So we're looking at his back laying on the ground. And Burn just does a, such a great job. of drawing figures in perspective. You know, I've been thinking about with uh, our art book study group that we do on Patreon about what to, uh, what book to do once we finish Walt Reed's The Figure. And I am really leaning towards a perspective book because I feel like a proper understanding of perspective helps so much with visual storytelling. Anyway, we've got Colossus's massive body kind of laid out here.
And it is a little hard to see because you've got all these overlapping forms. You've got like his foot here. His lower leg is up. You've got that cuff that uh, covers his knee. And you've got his leg coming back down. So his other foot, Burn even has the other foot. You have, see it sticking out on the side here, underneath his arm, between his arm and his body on the ground. You can see the, the other foot there. <clears throat> I don't need to draw that in. It'll just clutter this, but you know, he's very thorough. Now what's interesting is, again, we see another figure running from what's going on here, but this time the figure is going off panel. So if I were to speculate, I'd say that this figure, as opposed to being an important part of the storytelling, leading the eye to the next panel, this is just because Byrne probably drew this and felt like the, the scene felt empty without a little background figure. But you've got uh, that big hole in the building and the blob leaping out of it. Let's see here. Yeah, Martin mentioned uh, the specter. Yeah, definitely uh, his work with, uh, with Ostrander. Um, Aparo's work with Ostrander. Let's see here. <laughs> Back to facial hair. Neymar says, I've always used my clippers. He said, razors make the skin feel like Velcro and sensitive, like it was cutting too close. Yes, that's exactly what I do. I use um, the uh, those edgers. I use the edgers because they cut it down enough that visually there's no stubble. But I can still feel a little bit of it, so I use edgers to uh, to shave my face and my head, as opposed to using like a actual like razor, like a traditional razor. Traditional razors, if I use those, I get horrible razor burn. So I just gotta, you know, I mean, you get black men talking on facial care. That's like a whole thing right there. Like just the stuff we have to do so that our face don't come out just just with all of the bumps and all of it. Like if you do anything wrong, your face is gonna be bumpy and in pain. So it's like, you know, what kind of oils you use? Do you use, not oils, but like, are you using Noxzema to do the skin cleaner, a little bit of Neutrogena after, afterwards? It's like, it's, it's a whole thing. Every, 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 every black man got a different routine for, for taking care of their face. Let's see here. Yeah, Amar says, I looked good, but too close. He says, I don't have no problem with using clippers to shave out all my hair. Uh, I let it grow for months. Um... Yeah, for me, I end up, I usually should shave my head. Uh, I try to tell myself to shave my head once a month, but for me, it's just one of those things where I'll just be walking around. And for me, it's temperature. I'll be walking around, all of a sudden, I feel warmer than usual, and I'll feel, run my hand across my head, and I'm like, oh, it's grown from bald to, like, low stubble to, like, now starting to feel like I have hair, and that's just when I know when to shave it. It's not, It ends up being about every three weeks or so, but I don't have any kind of schedule. I just go by feel. And then uh, Martin says, thanks for the compliment of the thumbnail. You're more than welcome. It looks very dope. You know what it reminds me of? It's like a kind of a, a Bill Sienkiewicz or like a Dennis Cowan drawing with a Bill Sienkiewicz painting underneath it. That's kind of what it reminds me of. Or maybe a little bit of Kyle Baker. Point is that it looks dope. Um, let's see here. Johnny's got to take off. Um, heading out. Goes up to the cafe. Says, I'll DM you later, dude. All right, man. Hope, uh, hope all goes well. I'll talk to you later. Peace. Let's see here. And then Amar says, uh, yeah, I used to use Noxema in the past, but I can get uh, messy unless the hair is really low. Um, well, what's funny is I use the, I actually use my Noxema. I will use it after I shave. More often than not, what I do is I put it on while I'm in the shower. So I get in, instead of like washing my face regular stuff, I'm in the shower, I got a jar of Noxema in there. First thing I do, I hop in, I wash my face with the Noxema, and then I just rinse it off while I'm doing the rest of my cleaning and just, you know. That's my uh, my Nagzima routine. And so I'm noticing here the blob's position. His head is just breaking 
the surface of the top of that um that building. Gives you a sense of his position and his scale. Probably made that head a little too big. The Blob is actually one of those characters who he's kind of difficult to thumbnail out in boxes and spheres because he's so round. It almost actually kind of works better to do him as a sphere. There's little stick figures for the feet coming out. Shoulders up, fist down. And he's got those little speed lines of him coming out. And you get that very simple transition of motion from coming up and out to next panel, down and in. I'm going to draw that arrow in afterwards because it's going to get in the way of me sketching in the figure. And really not so much perspective on this other panel, but you just get a sense of a ground plane there and the blob smashing into the middle of it. It really gives you that sense of compression. Like if, uh, for those of you that are into animation, the whole beanbag squash and stretch exercise, that is what's going on right here with the blob. You can even feel it with uh, that w yellow waistband that he has. Feeling like it's... And here's another thing. Now I see I'm doing that same mistake that I made with Colossus up above. Let me erase this a little bit. My reason why I'm erasing this is because I'm looking and I started sketching the blob in with sort of his axis like this. Like if you were a cube drawing him like this. And the fact of the matter is that he's not. If you look at his shoulder blades in the position, his axis is actually off to the side. He's actually, it's not way off, but it's more like, like this. And that difference is one of those things I was saying that that subtle feel that he gets. So if I actually want to go in there and draw this and have it have more of the gesture that Burn put down on the page, then I want to come in here and maybe indicate a little bit of a, an axis this way so that I can kind of build that drawing the, the waistband is what made me realize it. It's like I looked at the waistband that I was drawing and I realized well, that's not wrapping around this form the way it should be. And I realized it's because I'm conceiving of the form with the wrong axis. Axis being that, uh, you know, if you're tra drawing like, if you're looking at like 3D models that have an X, Y, and Z axis, you know, his axis should be tilted more up that way. By the way, after I finish this panel, we're going to call it um because it's been about an hour but let me ask you guys so i have i saved five pages of this sequence do you guys want me to continue doing this next week or do you want me to go back to some illustration stuff because i'm still not at the point where i'm going to be doing thumbnails and character designs for my next comic like believe it or not i am still writing in fact i'm kind of like going back and doing a, a new draft on my uh my outline for the first issue but in the meantime, I can either start on another illustration or I can keep doing these John Byrne studies. Let me know either here in the chat or if you guys are watching later in the comments whether you want me to start a new illustration or keep doing uh, 
at least finishing these five pages of burn uh this five page sequence that i have of uh from days of futures past doing studies of it let me know what you guys would like to see and uh and i will uh act accordingly anyway colossus just barely barely dipping out of the path of the blobs not inconsiderable mass. And I feel like somewhere in this story, I can't remember, because um, I didn't actually sit down and read all of Days of Futures Past again before doing this, but I feel like there is a panel where the blob doesn't miss and fully lands on Colossus and smothers him. But if it's not in this story, then there is some point where the blob lands on uh, on Colossus. Although I may be misreading because I've read so many Marvel comics growing up, and it could be that he landed on um, on either the Hulk or maybe even the Juggernaut. Because I know that there was a point where it said the immovable object versus the uh, the unstoppable Juggernaut. I remember seeing that in a uh, a comic once. For some reason, I think the X Men were teamed up against the uh, teamed up with Juggernaut against the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. All of that that X Men uh, lore is mushy in my head because it's been so many years since I've read it. And I'll also tell you that I may have gotten the composition right, but I drew these figures too large within the the frame of the page. Because if you look like Colossus and uh, if I were to draw a mid a line across the midpoint of this panel, their heads are just a little bit above that. You know, Blob's head is just barely above that midline, and Colossus, you know, maybe below two thirds. But if I look at mine, I drew them way too high in the panel. So, and all of these things are important because, you know, that's less of composition storytelling and, and more of composition. If you are collaborating and you have to leave room for your letterer, you got to make sure that they, uh, you know, there's room for the text. And if you're lettering your own comics, you may come back later and say, "Damn it, why didn't I leave enough room for the text?" But that's another thing to keep in mind. Leaving room for lettering when you're making comics—that is part of the composition. Oh yeah, Amar and I were talking about uh, hair stuff, and it's like, yeah, nair is what you use to remove hair. I never used that. I think I maybe used it on my beard once, but noxema is the the facial cleanser. That's what I use to uh, clean my face because it helps. It just helps keep me from getting razor bumps. Because I'll get razor bumps even with uh, with clippers. But for those of you who are watching who don't necessarily have sensitive skin, you might be like, why are y'all tripping about razor bumps? If you do have sensitive skin and you get razor bumps, which a lot of black men do, um, it is no joke. It is really uncomfortable and really unpleasant. It's a big deal. Anyway, this panel is mostly, you've got really, yes, there is a background, but it is a background of speed lines. and force force lines impact lines from uh the blob smashing into the ground and you've got little bits and particles of uh of gravel and turf getting broken up from the impact of him slamming in there
Yeah, I forget how well Byrne can draw small figures, Colossus and Blob. Or so that's the thing. He makes so much of this not feel tall. He makes it small. He makes these characters feel so much larger than life that even when they are tiny figures in a panel, he draws them with as much detail and love as if they were a splash page. So yeah, really it's just energy transferring in terms of blob coming down and then the energy of his impact spilling out. Which is a great way to end a panel because you're not worried about transitioning into the next panel. The next transition is going to be the, uh, the following page. So yeah, it's another breakdown analysis of, uh, of John Burns' fantastic storytelling in, um, in X-Men Days of Futures Past. You guys let me know if you want to see a few more pages of this. I'm not going to do, obviously, the whole issue. I picked five pages. I did breakdowns. I did studies, analysis, diagrams for two of them. If you guys want more, let me know in the chat. Let me know in the comments. And uh, we're going to wrap it up here. So if you guys would like to get additional bonus live streams, um, that's the art book study group that I was telling you guys about where we dig into some of the best art books around. We've been doing a long running series on, um, on Walt Reed's The Figure. You know what? I've been doing it for long enough that I think we've got a few old videos. I've made one of them public. I think I might, might make one or two more from the art book study group public as well for you guys, just so you can get a check, chance to check out, see what I'm talking about here. So I'll go through and find some of the older videos and maybe I'll make one or two of those public as well. Um, I've also been meaning to go through and just take maybe some excerpts and highlights from recent videos and just make give you guys like a short five-minute clip. But anyway, you can get access to that. You get a digital archive where you can read my comics online. You, we have a Patreon-exclusive Discord server where we share art book, artwork, give feedback, um, encouragement, share tips, tools, process, and just goof around and talk about art topics online. We've had a lot of AI talk, um, mid-journey talk, on the, uh, the Discord server lately. That's been fun and interesting and terrifying. And, you know, but that's what, hey, you know, can't shy away from the future. So all of that is on patreon.com slash Jeremy. That's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. For as little as $2 a month, you can get access to that. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, go to the channel page. It's on the uh, the About tab. You can get links to, uh, to the Patreon, um, little as $2 a month. You can also get links to sign up for my newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. Uh, you get a free digital sketchbook when you sign up. I send out a newsletter once a month. It's a collection of posts where I talk about uh, what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me. Uh, usually a link to one of the particular live streams that's, uh, I think that's one of the more interesting ones I did over the course of the month. Uh, some work in progress, animated GIFs on there, and some thoughts on my, my creative work as well. Get all of that at newsletter.jeremy.net. That's a free newsletter. And again, if you want to purchase physical copies of my comic books or read digitally on Comixology or Kindle, go to amazon.jeremy.net. Pick up books like my first graphic novel. It's a standalone self-contained book. I Have the Gods, a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. My most recent comic book series, Morning Star, Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. It's an eight-issue series. Volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains issues five through eight. Both volumes have extensive back matter, character sketches, um, character designs, thumbnails, page layouts, photo reference, uh, and more. All of that at amazon.jeremy.net. And again, um, there are page flip-throughs, book flip-throughs on my YouTube homepage. If you're watching on Twitch or on other platforms, you can find links to hop on over to the YouTube page and check those out. So again, everyone, thank you so much for the great comments, um, for the great discussion and feedback. Uh, it's always great to have you guys here. I greatly appreciate you. Thanks so much. 
that's it for now. Go be 